miscellaneous topics? Is this just something you have uh, several things thrown out there? No, well, this is this is that list of those things that you had asked me to kind of cover a few things, and they're the okay. things that <clears throat> that are going to be on your exam more than likely, or at least one or two of these probably will be. These are some high impact areas as far as um, you know. You need to know it for the exam, but also these are things that at some point you're more than likely going to see in the course of your career. But the question is. Will you recognize it? Because, you know, we've talked about zebras in the past and how, you know, the saying, if you're on the plains of West Texas and you hear hoofbeats, you should be looking for horses, not zebras. But you still have to think about zebras because otherwise you won't recognize that black and white striped horse. And in the course of putting some of these together, I'm going, yeah, I'm pretty sure that I've seen some of these cases before and I just didn't recognize them. So, you know, it's, it, you're not alone in that but it is something that, that you need to kind of keep some kind of remembrance of in the back of your mind. <clears throat> so with that said, first thing is actually a video or a slide that I just saw on Facebook <clears throat> and feel free to steal this. It's uh, I think that this is very telling and unfortunately it's humorous because it happens. <laughs> so we'll get on from that. So our first topic, rheumatoid arthritis. First off, this is, this is a, a problem that is very predominant. We have a lot of people that have this, and it really can start any time, including there is a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, or JRA, um, and it can affect any joint, but usually it's going to be the fingers and hands are where you're going to see it. It's more likely to be female than male, and whereas osteoarthritis affects only the joints. Rheumatoid arthritis can also spread to other areas and can give you a whole lot of other problems too. It is an autoimmune disorder. So that's why it can cause so many other things. Really for us, our main care is gonna be supportive. It's gonna be giving them analgesics. It's going to be splinting if they need it. And in those cases, we're usually talking about a joint that's been so deformed that it has dislocated and occasionally steroids. The steroids you're not going to see any any relief from, but it is something that you can end up um, helping somebody hours later. So I don't know if y'all can see my um, pointer here or not, but I want to point out on the top left, this is what's called a boutonniere deformity. And this is a very common deformity for people to have. This is an example of it as well in an actual person, but that's, that is what's called a boutonniere's deformity. If you see that, that is almost always rheumatoid arthritis. On the bottom left here, you have some examples or an example of an x-ray on somebody's hand. And I have seen this so many times in these little ladies that are in their 70s and 80s that they have so much rheumatoid arthritis that, they, that their hand is just so malformed. So, you know, something for you to look at. Now, this bottom right one is one that really should scare us a lot, okay? These folks, of course, are more prone to fall, but they also, as a result, are more prone to have some of these things, which this is called an atlanto-occipital uh, or atlanto-axial disruption. And so you see that yellow line there is the space that's between the atlas, C1, and the dens of C2. And so as a result of that, that has actually pushed the skull and the atlas forward. So that can impinge on the brainstem because the brainstem descends down into that same space. So we see this, not that particular thing a lot, but we see a lot of people with rheumatoid arthritis. If they have falls and stuff, you need to take a little more time, do a better assessment of all systems, just because you don't want to miss something like this. So any questions on rheumatoid arthritis? Okay. So let's talk now, let's move to a different sort of arthritic thing. And this once again <clears throat> is an autoimmune disorder. This is scleroderma. Now it's systemic, 
but really it, where we end up seeing it initially is in the skin. Okay, so Andrew, excellent question. How would rheumatoid arthritis present in organ systems if besides the skeleton? Once again, it ends up because it's a disease process that can cause you to have autoimmune stuff. It can end up giving you some renal issues. It can sometimes give you uh, pneumonias because their pulmonary function is diminished as well. Not because they can't breathe, but because it'll attack the, the lungs itself. These are things that generally we're not going to see. Usually for us in the pre-hospital arena, what we're going to end up seeing is due to trauma um, and pain. So, but it's an excellent question, but just think about an autoimmune disorder, any of them can generally cause problems with any of the organ systems and it usually diminishes their function. But excellent question, thank you. So um, in scleroderma, and this is actually now beginning to be talked about with a lot of these autoimmune things, is that there's some evidence that suggests environmental and genetic factors both play a part in these. Dustin, yes, people are definitely more susceptible to joint injury with rheumatoid arthritis. As you can see, those their tendons and stuff will tend to actually pull things off to the side. That's how you end up with that boutonniere's deformity is because you have a shortening of that tendon and it'll end up now in those cases, it's probably a little less likely, but some of these little ladies that have their hands off to the side, their fingers pushed off, they are more likely to end up dislocating them. Um, and just simply because of age, they're more likely to have fractures but and those, those fractures can end up in the joints. And it's a nightmare for orthopedics because there's not really a lot that they can do for that because they're always, um, they're always having some problems with those joints and they end up a lot of times fused as a result of that. But yes, excellent question. So scleroderma, um, this is a devastating problem. It, it really is. There is so much proliferation of the vascular lesions in the small arteries and arterioles. It ends up that they'll end up with, with necrotic areas in hands and feet. Um, and also it ends up in all of their internal organs as well. And also because it alters their immunity, then they're more likely to end up with serious infections. Now, a little bit of incidence, 276 cases per million. That's not very many. It's more likely in blacks and whites. And I thought that this was interesting. I'd never seen this anywhere else. Oklahoma Choctaw Indians have the absolute highest prevalence, 469 per 100,000, which is 20 times higher than the rest of the population. It's more likely women, the men, and it usually has peak onset in the ages of 30 to 50. Um, so we talked about the infarction, so they can end up with the tips of their fingers becoming uh, necrotic because of infarctions. They often have pulmonary hypertension. Um, myositis is inflammation and infection in the muscles themselves. Once again, that's usually due to those micro infarctions renal failure, wound infections. And I thought that this was interesting, the predictors of worse outcome. Older male, if they show up with creatinine of three or more at presentation, which means that they already have renal failure um, and poor blood pressure control with the, in the first three days of their crisis. And I thought this was interesting, normal blood pressure. They should actually have an elevated blood pressure because of the vasculitis. And if they've already been on ACE inhibitors, then that's a big problem in a lot of cases. And it's because you're already attacking the kidneys even more. Um, and yes, uh, infarctions can be in any of the digits. So fingers and toes. So that's what they mean by digital. It's, it's in any of the digits. So 
I'm not going to go through this entire list with you. You can go back and, and look at this on the video. What I do want you to, to see here is these are a couple of very typical pictures of folks with scleroderma. On the left, the woman, you can see she has absolutely no skin lines, no wrinkles, and her face is very tight. You can't really get a good sense of it, but a lot of times these folks will also have a tightening of their mouth so that their mouth becomes smaller. They can't open it as wide because of all these, these skin areas that have now shrunk and tightened. <clears throat> Dustin, actually, the, they should usually have an elevated blood pressure because their vascular walls are thicker, and so it's not as distensible. So good question, though. Uh, and that's why a lot of these folks are already on ACE inhibitors when they finally do come to a crisis point um, because I'm, I'm on an angiotensin receptor blocker for my blood pressure. So ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers are in the same family. So, you know, they're a popular set of drugs. Good question, though. Um, <clears throat> on the left and or on the right hand side in this picture, you can see this hand. And I know it's a little bit difficult to, to really make it out, but if you look at the picture, you don't see any skin lines or wrinkles on that hand at all. They, they call that sclerodactyly, and that's because these hand, the fingers are like sausages. They're very tight. They can't move them very well because they're so tight. If you've ever had a finger that's swollen, you know, it's difficult to move because you don't have that ability to stretch the skin back and forth. Um, they're, since they have these areas where the circulation to their fingers is so poor, they end up with Raynaud's phenomenon. Um, anyone know what Raynaud's is? Can you unmute and just give us a quick, this is what this is for that? If not, that's okay. Bye. My understanding is Raynaud's phenomenon is a clear demarcation um, between where tissue is perfused and where it's not perfused on exposure to cold air or cold water. Okay, that <clears throat> it's not necessarily a clear, like a sharp demarcation, like, you know, you put your finger into cold water and it was up to here and there's a sharp line. It can have that, but it is usually, it's usually more of a fading sort of thing. So if you see it, it's usually that they have this erythema coming up to that area, but then the actual digit is just pale white. There's no blood flow to that area. The blood, the problem with Raynaud's is that the blood vessel is inappropriately contracting to the point where there is no more blood flow to it. And since they're already more prone to have uh, microinfarctions because of the, the inflammation of the vascular walls, it's already thickened. So instead of having this much space, they may now only have this much space. So when it does start to clamp down because of the cold, then it clamps off completely. But, and if you ever see it, you'll never forget it. It's a very painful process. Um, they end up a lot of times with GI issues. They especially will end up with difficulty breathing and restrictive lung diseases, especially because their chest wall just does not move as well. It's a very, very sad disease to see. Um, but once again, you can end up with a lot of these things that are on this list. Um, Sika syndrome, it's one of the terms that you probably have never heard before. And so the, the, thing to know about Sika syndrome is they generally do not produce saliva. And so their mouth is chronically dry. As a result of that, they can end up losing teeth. They're more prone to having uh, caries and other dental infections. Um, they also end up with so oral fibrosis that, were, that I was talking about with their mouth getting to where they cannot open it up adequately. Um, and then I thought it was interesting, a retinal artery occlusion is more common in these folks. I've never seen that in them, but I don't see a ton of these people. Um, any questions about scleroderma? For us, 
really the treatment is going to be mostly recognizing that these folks have this issue. Most of them will already be diagnosed. They're going to tell you that. And our care is mostly going to be symptomatic, just taking care of the, the symptoms. Um, and steroids do have a place, but it's mostly in long-term care situations. So in, in other words, for them, that's a long-term treatment. So Michelle, headache under the neuropathy. Well, actually it was under the neuropsychiatric. Okay, so neurology and psychiatry kind of go together. So the, they're more prone to have headaches because of the vasculitis. Excellent question though. They're also more likely to have stroke. <clears throat> um, the ACE inhibitors being contraindicated, yeah, I, that's one of those, first off, we're not going to be prescribing those. Now, if they symptomatically need something, that's what you have, then a short-term course is not going to be indicated or is not going to be a problem. But as far as, you know, long-term sort of things, you're, unfortunately, that's beyond me because I don't take care of these sort of uh, problems. Um, it would end up coming to a uh, rheumatologist and probably a, a nephrologist. So um, arthritis doctor and a kidney doctor and let them be the ones to fight it out in, in the ring, so to speak. But uh, it's a good question. Any questions on scleroderma before we move on? Y'all are coming up with some really good questions. I, I really do appreciate that. I know that people sometimes think that we just are pandering to you, but I, I appreciate that. That tells me that I need to explain stuff a little more. Serum sickness. So serum sickness can happen from a lot of things. The classic description is that it is a result of an injection of something, usually serum-based product, hence the name, uh, or some other foreign protein. But other things can cause it too. 1905 was when it was first described. Fever, skin eruptions, joint pain, and lymphadenopathy. And then some medications, especially penicillin and NSAIDs, can commonly cause it as well. And it's after the exposure. So obviously the main thing, anytime that you have kind of an allergic reaction of any sort or a hypersensitivity reaction is stop whatever caused it. Kind of makes sense. So now I thought that the symptoms you know, that show up, once again, think of this as something that has been injected into somebody and they're having a reaction to it. Their body is trying to fight it off. Fever and malaise, you're gonna see that because that's part of your body's defense. We talked about it during the fever lecture. It's supposed to be there, okay? They can end up with skin eruptions. They can end up with complaints. And, and a lot of times they will complain of pain in joints, okay? I don't, the times that I've seen it and I don't see it very often, GI complaints, I don't see much other than nausea, okay? Headaches, nah, I can't really say that I've ever heard folks saying that that's, their main problem or what what brought them in um, but they can certainly have pain in, in muscles and stuff it can present a lot like an influenza and so you know I, probably we need to ask more often if people have had some of the those things that are common to cause this and if you look at the adverse reactions list for pretty much any medication it's going to have symptoms of serum sickness in there now, I may actually go ahead and spell that out, but most of the time it just gives you this list of symptoms like this. Phlebitis around the injection site is not very likely because we're talking about exposure one to three weeks prior to the event. So it can happen quicker, but most of the time it's going to be a, a more sy uh, systemic, generalized sort of reaction. So, you know, if it's that early on, it's a different mechanism than this. Okay, this is what's called a type 3 hypersensitivity as opposed to anaphylaxis. Um, and most of the time, honestly, phlebitis is just an irritative reaction to having an IV in place or having an extravasation. So skin rashes, most of the time they're going to be urticarial. And in those cases, it's raised, it's red, 
and it's usually somewhat demarcated, the serpiginous. There's a, there's a good word for you to throw out there the next time that you're playing Scrabble, serpiginous. And what that means is that the edges are more serpent-like. So they're more of a more defined character and they look like a snake. So just like I said, one of those interesting words that's fun to throw around. Um, <clears throat> but you can have a lot of other rashes. Lymphadenopathy may happen, not very often, arthritis. Now, in my experience, and I haven't seen tons of these, they usually complain of pain in their joints. And it's usually the larger joints, at least in my experience. Now, they're saying the MCP joints, so right here at the base of the fingers and their knees. Um, edema is usually present. Um, I don't usually get a UA on these people unless they're saying that they're that they're having blood in their urine. Um, and then the neurologic issues, I can't say that I've ever seen those. Now, the one that would be kind of scary and we do see listed on a lot of vaccines and stuff is Guillain-Barre. And I don't know if y'all remember a few years, probably not, it was back in the uh, 80s and 90s, we were having a number of people coming in after getting vaccinations and having Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a scary thing because uh, I, I didn't see the patient, but in my residency, they said, you know, hey, we, we had this girl that came in that she had been taken by her family to two other hospitals before they came to us. And the complaint was that she was getting weaker and weaker in her legs. And the father said that he had to physically carry his daughter out of the hospital before they came to ours. And this had gone on over the course of a week or so. And Guillain-Barre, if you're not familiar with it, is an ascending paralysis. And it starts in their lower extremities, works its way up. And you don't know how high it's going to get. Sometimes it gets high enough that it involves the respiratory muscles and they end up on a ventilator. The good news is that the symptoms all abate, but it's not always complete. So some folks are left with some residual effects, but um, it, it's a devastating illness, especially if it's not caught. So um, something to keep in mind. Um, any questions on that one? I believe that's the last. No. So here we go. This, this actually has an interesting differential diagnosis list. Anaphylaxis, endocarditis, vasculitis, once again, you know, relating to the phlebitis question from Dustin there. Um, strep glomerulonephritis. So there's something that you don't see very often, but um, streptococcal disease, strep throat can cause you to have a glomerulonephritis, which is an inflammation of the kidney. That's going to go away. So that one's not a big deal. Systemic lupus erythematosus. So that's a totally other zebra sort of thing. And they generally are already diagnosed. Hepatitis and sickle cell disease are trait. Guess what we're going to be talking about in just a little bit. So the treatment, once again, stop whatever caused it. Okay. And said, ironically, unless they're the ones that caused it, may actually help with the symptoms, as will antihistamines. Severe cases, corticosteroids, frankly, every case that I get is going to get dexamethasone. Just they will, because I'm going to treat them that way. Um, and always default to transport in case the case worsens. Okay, so in other words, if you see one of these and you suspect this, you should always urge them to, to go with you to the hospital. <laughs> yeah, Dustin, excellent point. Every one of these is going to seem like it's an episode from House. Every one of them, I guarantee it. So, sickle cell anemia. This is... A, a disease process that is genetic. It is seen predominantly in African Americans, well, in people of African and Mediterranean descent. And there's some question as to whether or not this is actually a 
useful genetic mutation because these people that have sickle cell trait, not the disease, are less likely to get malaria. And so there has been some discussion as to, okay, in these people, maybe this was actually something that was a good thing for them to have, the trait, not the disease. Now, sickle cell disease is that they actually have the gene from both parents. You can see it's autosomal recessive. So if you have one gene from one parent, then you have sickle cell trait. If you have one from each parent, then you have sickle cell disease. And so instead of having regular hemoglobin, you have what's called hemoglobin S. And so as you can see in this picture, especially down in the bottom, or I guess it'd be the, the bottom one quarter uh, or middle one quarter, there's a picture of a, of a hemoglobin S cell that then turns to a darker color and then becomes sickled and it kind of looks like a sickle shape. So kind of this sort of a shape. And the problem with sickle cells is that they don't bend. In our capillaries, our capillary beds are a little less than one hemoglobin or one um, red blood cell thick. And so as a result, your red blood cell actually has to squeeze a little bit to get through that capillary bed. But the problem with the sickle cell is it doesn't bend. So it can't flex to be able to get through those capillary beds. And as a result, they end up with occlusions. So as, we, as this slide points out in the next to the last thing, even sickle cell trait can have crisis because they don't produce normal hemoglobin. But the expression of that is very variable. Um, so, Michael, let's see the, the question here. Um, if someone were to need blood, can they receive a normal blood transfusion? Absolutely. And as you're going to see, that's actually one of the mainstays of treatment. Um, yeah, actually, there are a lot of places where sickle cell calls are very common. So, um, and actually, the hospital that I'm working at now, it's a very common thing for us to see. So a few points, this is a very busy slide. I'm not gonna hit on every little point in here. Once again, I'm assuming that you're gonna go back and, and look at the video and take some notes on some of these things. But screening is mandatory at birth in the United States for all children. Um, and then the childhood manifestations can be devastating, especially if they end up with this thing called aplastic crisis they basically stop producing all blood cells. Um, and it is, it is devastating. Another thing is most of these kids will, will have splenic sequestration. And so they end up losing their spleen. They have what's called an autosplenectomy. And so um, the spleen is still there, but it's just not functional anymore. Um, as a result of that though, the spleen helps with your immunity, especially to encapsulated bacteria. And so they're more likely to get strep pneumonia infections and all streptococcal things to begin with. And then as you can see there, as they get older, they're more likely to have salmonella infections. Um, so those are, those are some really bad things. Um, Justin, we're going to kind of come to that in just a second. Um, so hand foot syndrome. Swollen, painful hands and feet, especially in kids, this is something that really needs to get your attention. Um, night, night. And acute chest syndrome. And acute chest syndrome can happen at any age. And that's really one of the main things that needs to be addressed as an emergency. Um, PAH is pulmonary artery hypertension. We're not going to diagnose that in the field. Um, and even in kids, they may have strokes, very, very devastating problems. They end up a lot of times with skin problems because they don't get the circulation that they need because of occlusions. Um, and then half of the hemoglobin S or the, the heterogeneous, so they have one S gene and one 
normal gene, and I put that the wrong way, will have a vasoocclusive crisis. So now triggers for any of these crises, hypoxia, dehydration, altered body temperature, um, infections, which of course would be the source of the fever. Any of those things can cause these people to have crisis. So I like this, okay, seven management goals. You're gonna see that about half of them we can't do anything about, okay? But manage the, the occlusive crisis, the chronic pain syndromes. We can't do anything for hemolytic anemia. We just transport. We can't do much for infections other than if you're in a system where they do have some antibiotics, that may be something to consider management of the complications, that's really what we're there to try to either prevent or to address. Prevention of stroke, well, that's one of those that I can't really say that we're there to help prevent stroke other than if we have somebody that's having a crisis, our treatment may help to prevent the risk of that for that particular time. And then we're not gonna be able to detect and treat pulmonary hypertension. It requires ultrasound uh, echocardiography guidance. Um, so one, yes, they can get blood thinners. And in fact, they will end up with it. TPA will be effective in treating the stroke. That's an excellent question as well, uh, because they still have the same clotting mechanisms. That's still there. Diet with... With um, this, really, other than you know, probably staying staying on a low meth and low cocaine diet is probably the mainstay of dietary treatment. Obviously, with any of these folks, we're going to tell them you need to you need to have a good diet. You need to you know watch your weight, those sort of things. Um, you know, most of these folks are kind of small anyway because of the fact that they did not have as good of blood flow and stuff when they were younger. So, you know, I, I am struggling to remember, and Dustin, you may have a little more insight into this if you're running that many calls. I don't recall that many people that truly had sickle cell disease. Traits a different matter, but sickle cell disease, I don't remember a lot of them being obese. In fact, most of the ones that I'm thinking about right now are actually fairly thin. Uh, one guy is actually a, a corrections officer, and he is not your typical corrections officer. He's he's a pretty small guy. So, but that's a good question. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I, I don't, I still don't see that many, but I, I'll see, you know, maybe one or two a month. Sickle cell does not necessarily cause a rightward shift in the dissociation curve, but the fact that they become hypoxic because that cell no longer carries oxygen correctly can actually worsen their crisis. So most of the time, it's not that they, they become hypoxic and then they get a crisis. It's usually that they have a crisis and now those sickle cells are not carrying the oxygen appropriately. And so they, they don't pick up the oxygen. So in a sense, it actually shifts at the opposite direction. It doesn't hold on to it as well. Excellent question. So I went ahead and continued in this list with the treatments and the things that we can and cannot do. And really, it comes down to, for us, mostly what we're going to, to be doing is giving them pain control. So Opioids, NSAIDs, yes, they can take NSAIDs. In most places, unless you're with, with a certain crew members, you're not going to be given antibiotics uh, unless you're in a community paramedicine program, vaccines. That's not for acute stuff. That's for prevention. Endothelial, thelion one receptor agonist. Now, you're not going to be given that one. Um, hopefully, you're not giving out Cialis and Viagra. Um, folic acid, L-glutamine, antiemetics. So really the medications, you can limit it to opioids, NSAIDs, and antiemetics. That's really what we're here to give these people. Additionally, in the non-pharmacologic, you're going to see down in there, vigorous hydration and analgesic for crisis. Fluids are essential because they now have these areas where the blood is 
piling up and can't get through. And so we want to do something to make that blood less viscous so it's thinner so that it can get through. Now, you're not going to thin it by giving them anticoagulants, okay? That doesn't really make the blood thinner. Anticoagulants just means that it doesn't clot as easily. That's not the issue. The issue is that they have to get those cells through that capillary bed. Oxygen will help that because that will help them to return to a more normal state. And then, the, as we talked about, the antibiotics, if they have an infection, analgesia, um, transfusion, bronchodilators, those sort of things. And the IS is for incentive spirometry. So you want to be sure that you, if you have that capability, you want to be sure that you are uh, giving them appropriate therapy and, and checking to be sure that your bronchodilators are helping. Any more questions on sickle cell? Graves disease. So that sounds worse than it really is in a lot of cases. Understand that Graves is one of several autoimmune hyperthyroidism. Probably the one that, that I hear about more often is Hashimoto's thyroiditis because it's usually a very quick onset sort of thing. Graves is a more indolent sort of condition. So it comes on rather slowly. And most of the time, uh, the, the people with this will have an insidious onset but it's also more extensive. So they, they begin to have other problems. Once again, it's an autoimmune disorder. So let's see. Yeah, you know, the, the sickle cell thing, I, I just hope that we're not trying to do acupuncture in the back of an ambulance. That's kind of a bad place to try to do something like that. You know, a lot of these things, the acupuncture, acupressure things um, are things that, are on the fringe in a lot of cases. Um, and I'm not saying that it doesn't have some place in medicine. Um, I, I just know for me in emergency medicine, it's not something that I'm going to often recommend um, because first off, I, I can't really find any definite medical evidence that there is a good effect from it all the time consistently. In other words, if you have somebody that is getting sham treatment and somebody that is getting real treatment, a lot of times there is no difference between those two groups. It's a placebo type effect in, in a way. Um, and <laughs> the, the, the folks that get some relief from it, absolutely. If you if you get relief from something that's not harming anything, by all means, have at it. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely don't want somebody trying to treat a broken hip with acupuncture. <laughs> so, uh, but excellent point. Um, so back to Graves' disease. So this one has a lot of things that it's associated with, including type one diabetes, and then some other things, Sjogren syndrome, which is a combination of, of Sika syndrome. And it's basically everything is dry and shut down in the, in the ENT area. Uh, there's association with rheumatoid arthritis as well. We already talked about that, systemic lupus. Um, but the signs and symptoms. Generally, the way to think about Graves' disease and Hashimoto's, the difference between them being that Hashimoto's is generally a viral illness that has caused your body to attack the thyroid. And so it's usually a very quick onset and they get these symptoms that it's like night and day. But basically think about in a car engine, if you all of a sudden just stepped on the accelerator, so they have an increased metabolic rate, they lose weight, they're their temperature goes up, their skin is warm, they're sweating. They also, and this, this is a good term, pretibial myxedema. So in other words, it, if you have ever felt this, when you press on somebody's leg, like you're feeling for 
peripheral edema, like from congestive heart failure, you know, and that it's kind of firm and you push down and it leaves a thumbprint. With mixed edema, it's described as like bread dough. So if you've ever pressed on bread dough, yes, it will, it will go down, but it's a very different feel. It's not as firm under your, under your touch and it'll tend to leave an impression, but it'll also start to rebound quicker than it will from congestive heart failure. And the only way to really explain it is for you to see it. And it just doesn't happen very often, but think doughy, think of bread dough. Um, they also will have, since we're talking about that they're sweating all over, they're also sweating from their eyes. So they'll have conjunctivitis, they'll have chemosis. So they'll have a lot of tearing and stuff from their eyes. The lid lag is one of those things that frankly, I'm not sure that I've ever actually seen it. Um, but it's, there's a, there's, it's slow for their eyes to open back up after they blink. They often have proptosis, okay, meaning that the eye is starting to protrude, um, and also known as exophthalmos, um, and they'll have periorbital edema. So think everything is swollen. Once again, the mixed edema type stuff, but it's around the eyes. Uh, they have thyromegaly, but when you feel of it, it's not lumpy and bumpy, it's smooth. Um, and chances are, I, I don't palpate thyroids regularly. If I see a thyroid that's enlarged, it's really big. So yeah, you know, it's not something that most of us are gonna pick up on. Gynecomastia, so the men may develop breast, they have tachypnea, tachycardia. Once again, the accelerator is turned up. They may have murmurs. It's not because they have a, have a structural problem. It's just the flow is so fast that they will get turbulent flow and they end up with heart murmurs. They may have ectopic beats and irregular beats, uh, hyperactive bowel sounds. They may have vomiting and diarrhea. Um, they end up with tremors and they're usually restless, anxious, irritable. Once again, the accelerator is on the floor. So management, frankly, from our perspective, there's not going to be a lot that we can do other than symptomatic control. So, you know, this is, this management is long-term sort of stuff. So beta blockers, propranolol is what a lot of people are sent home on. Antithyroid medications, okay, we're not starting that. Propothiouracil or PTU is what is commonly used and it helps with the symptoms very quickly. But ultimately, they're going to have to go and they're going to have to get usually a radioactive iodine treatment. It's usually done at a cancer center. And it basically involves them walking in and taking tablets that have radioactive iodine. And it goes up there and it kills the thyroid. So these folks end up on thyroid supplement after that. And then also, you, you can have steroids that will decrease conversion of T4 to T3. T3 is the active form. T4 is a storage form. So, you know, these are, are some things that are long-term. And I thought it was interesting. I didn't know that corticosteroids are the only treatment for the Graves ophthalmopathy. That's an easy word to say, too. <clears throat> so, really, for us, the big thing is recognize these symptoms. Bring it to my attention. If you're bringing them in my ER, so, you know, I'm really kind of concerned that they may have some kind of a thyroid problem. Everything seems like they're just stepping on the accelerator and it could be Hashimoto's. It could be Graves there. So those are some of the things that, that we get concerned about. So autoimmune diseases, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know for sure the answer to that. And as we talked about on scleroderma, there is some evidence that environment and genetics play a part in it. Um, not the discussion necessarily to have here right now, but in the past year, I've changed my diet to a meat-based diet, carnivore. And a lot of the folks in, that are in that community 
talk about that they had some autoimmune sort of things, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And then there's several others, not necessarily these syndromes, that they say either their symptoms improved greatly since eating that way or went away completely. So, yeah, I think that there is a lot to be said for the fact that more and more of these diseases are increasing in their prevalence compared to, say, 1950s. And so perhaps there is something to um, the dietary changes that started shortly after World War II and some of those sort of, of things that have happened to our society. Um, for instance, wheat is not the same wheat as it was in the 1940s. Um, it's now been made into a different strain that has a different composition to it. Um, so, yeah, so it is a, it is an excellent question. So, yes, Igor and young Frankenstein had Graves' disease, and that that's true. Um, and PTSD and autoimmune disorders. Um, now, I, I haven't been reading in that. But then again, I, I don't really like looking into some of those sort of things. Um, yes, it's Frankenstein. That is correct. Um, so really, once again, our goal is to recognize and treat the symptoms. So there's another variant of this, which is thyroid storm, thyrotoxicosis, thyrotoxic crisis. There's a lot of different terms for it. You can have actually a low-grade thyrotoxicosis, which is not the, truly the same as thyroid storm, but just imagine that the thyroid is giving off too much hormone chronically. And then the thyroid storm is now somebody came and put a brick on the accelerator. So this is acute life-threatening. It's a hypermetabolic state because of the, the excessive hormones. And think about once again, the accelerator is stuck. So they have fevers, tachycardia, high blood pressure, uh, GI abnormalities. And because the thyroid storm is almost invariably fatal if untreated, we really need to, to have a high index of suspicion for this. If we see somebody where basically you're going, wow, it's like everything is, is up. So um, probably the next closest thing to this that we see is excited delirium because they really are very parallel. It's basically everything has just, you know, all the energy is going to that. Andrew, excellent question. I think that probably for some of these diseases, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, there is an actual increase in the, in the prevalence of them just simply because they are, there are so many more cases than there ever were before. If it was still the same sort of prevalence, you wouldn't see more people having severe disease. And so that's, that's really, it's an excellent question. And I think that in some cases, you now let's talk about ADHD briefly. In that case, the definition of the disease has been changed. And understand that dealing with things in the DSM-3 world versus the medical world are actually very different. And you know, a committee decides what's going into DSM-3 for psychiatry and, and psychology. So, you know, that's an example of one of those where there's increased or improved surveillance. It's not really improved surveillance. It's just they modified the definition. Um, but, you know, it's an excellent discussion. Maybe some, some night we need to have one where it's just open discussion time. Um, now, Will, I'm assuming that you're talking about in the thyrotoxicosis. Obviously, the quicker that it can be treated, the less likely it is that it's going to be fatal. 
But the problem is that a lot of times it reaches a critical point and it may not be recognized and somebody may not present until they're near collapse. Mm -hmm. And this one here, diagnosis is primary clin primarily clinical. This is something that we should be diagnosing. And um, once again, do not delay treatment pending laboratory studies. It takes me an hour to get anything back. So, you know, that's, that's why we shouldn't delay that. We'll kind of talk about that one. Excellent question. So first off, here's a list, and this is something that if you want to, you can actually, you know, kind of make a screenshot or something of this, and it will tell you what these common symptoms are. But if you, if you look at this list, you're going to see that most of it is somebody is stepping on the accelerator and they're not letting up. Okay. So the treatment supportive, once again, treat the things that are going to kill people. Those are always ABCs. So give them oxygen, ventilation, IV fluids. Now this is interesting to think about. It makes sense. They prefer dextrose solutions due to the increased metabolic needs. Trade any arrhythmias, aggressive cooling measures. So ice them down if you need to. Once again, add anti-adrenergic drugs. Propranolol is preferred, but you can give metoprolol. That's what my crews have. Um, you, can, you can give them calcium channel blockers, such as cardizem, if the beta blockers are contraindicated. The cardioselective stuff, the low pressure and those sort of drugs are preferred if they have react, uh, reactive airways disease. So you need to keep that in mind. Most places don't carry propranolol anymore, at least not pre-hospital. Um, we don't have antithyroid drugs available. Um, iodine, once again, we don't usually carry that. Uh, steroids, we do carry these in a lot of cases. Hydrocortisone and dexamethasone, okay? You can give those. They will help. Addison's, Addison's disease, um, this Addison's is due to adrenal cortical insufficiency. And it's usually that the whole um, adrenal is gone. So you get mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid deficiencies and hyperpigmentation. So there was always this question, did John F. Kennedy have Addison's? Because he always had this bronze skin. Um, they're weak all over, they're fatigued, nausea, vomiting. Um, and then in an acute presentation, they're vomiting. They're, they can have vascular collapse because they are so, so volume depleted. They a lot of times will have acute abdominal pain and they have hyperpyrexia. So their temperature may be over 105. And one, I think I just realized that I didn't answer that question. In the people back with the thyroid, thyroid storm, giving them sedatives is not going to hurt anything. But, and especially if they're shivering and stuff, it helps in those cases. But at the same time, you have to continue to give the rest of these things, especially if it was mistaken that, you know, hey, we thought that he had been using some meth or some bath salts or something. He ended up with the sagitated delirium. But no, he's actually thyroid storm. You know, in those cases, the treatment, if you give them the IV fluids, you start cooling them and those sort of things, you know, giving somebody that's got agitated delirium is giving them a steroid ain't going to hurt them. So, you know, the, if these folks are fighting you, then, you know, benzos or a sedative is, is probably not going to hurt them in those cases. But of course, that's a hot topic right now. So back to Addison's physical examination. They're dry, they're hypotensive, they are orthostatic, and they in females they have decreased body hair everywhere because of loss of androgens. And for us, hydrocortisone and IV fluids. Okay, if they're having a crisis, hydrocortisone, and you can use dexamethasone as well, will help this. Since we're running 
low on time, I'm going to kind of fly through what's left here. Cystic fibrosis. This is a multi-organ problem. Now, we're all used to the pulmonary stuff because that's what we usually end up seeing. But just remember that this is actually a pancreatic problem primarily. And the mucus plugging and those sort of things come about as a result of other mechanisms. 90% of the people will have pulmonary disease, and that's usually what kills them. And the median age at diagnosis is six to eight months. So they're usually diagnosed pretty quickly. Parents bring their kids in for, for, I think they may have this on a fairly common basis to the ERs, pediatric ERs. So, you know, it's not something that you guys are gonna, gonna diagnose. So, excellent question, Will. I'll be honest with you, I didn't actually see a long list of, of causes of death when I was looking into this, but I can imagine that some infections, other infections are going to be some of the other causes. Frankly, most of these kids used to not live beyond about 20, but they've started doing a bunch of other treatment that's way beyond where I'm at that has actually really improved the, the life of these kids. They're no longer having to do the percussion and postural drainage. Um, and so, or you're not having to beat your kid. They actually have some chest that uh, massage things that will, are vests that go on them that will do that for them. Um, yeah, a lot of times the, the diagnosis may initially be missed. Um, Actually, it's not because of pancreatic enzyme deficiency that they're more likely to develop diabetes. It's just simply because of overall pancreatic malfunction that they end up more likely. And it's not really a, a huge problem. You're not gonna see every kid with cystic fibrosis that has diabetes, but I believe that there is a higher prevalence. I didn't actually see a number for that, so, you know, most of these things, as far as the, the signs and symptoms, we're not going to see them. Meconium ileus? Really? Okay. Um, but think about their abdomen is going to be somewhat distended. Most of the time, once again, when we're getting calls, it's because of breathing problems. So really, that's where you need to, to look at most of these is pulmonary, because that's what we're going to see. I mean, we're really not going to see failure to thrive very often in these kids because usually their parents are very attentive. And so they are, they are taking them. The, the foul smelling platus and, and stools, that, at least from my recollection, was one of the biggest things that would cause the parents to come in and start wanting to know if these people if these kids had this was because of that, because they had looked at a list and they'd seen that. Um, so CPAP is actually a good intervention because you can help to remove some of those mucus plugs, get them moving a little bit. Um, and let's see. Yeah. I, I don't know that, uh, I've ever heard that Andrew about the, um, being a genetic advantage, never really have heard that. Now, when you say uh, heavy metal toxicity, you mean from Led Zeppelin LED or LEAD? And yes, they, as Jane points out, they are really prone to infections. And so you got to be on top of that sort of stuff. Um, so the diagnosis. Now, this is, this is new because obviously now we have genetic testing. When I was a resident, we didn't know anything about that stuff back then. It just wasn't available. Uh, you could get it, but it's, it's really something that is, has exploded in the past few years. So they're saying that the diagnosis requires genetic testing or sweat chlorides plus any one of the following. COPD, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or another family member, usually a sibling with it. So 
you know, it's it's one of those that the diagnosis has changed somewhat, especially compared to when when I was a resident. So once again, these kids are almost always going to be diagnosed before we get involved with them at all. And our treatment is supportive care, looking to make sure that they're oxygenating, that they're ventilating, uh, giving them bronchodilators. Um, Steroids are, are going to be helpful as well. Um, but really, the biggest thing is IV fluids. These kids are all dry because they've been working so hard to breathe. They have an increase, they call an insensible loss of fluids through their, their breathing. So IV fluids really help. They also help to break up the mucus because now it's not as, as dry as it was otherwise nebulizer treatments because of that increased moisture will help too. Usually they've already maxed those out though. So any other questions on CF? I really only have one more slide. I didn't get to do any any questions on these <clears throat> and you know maybe we need to kind of do some of those at some point as well with the you know just open table sort of thing. Um, but I do want to want to come to and talk to you a little bit about what do you do if somebody comes up and, and they say, hey, you know, my daughter has congenital adrenal hyperplasia. What are you going to do for that? Okay, well, first off, what we're talking about in these cases are rare conditions. I happen to be on GTAC Medical Directors Committee when the EpiPen law came about and after that law was passed we were tasked with writing some of the rules but then that same meeting we had a woman who came saying that she wanted every ambulance in the state of texas to carry hydrocortisone because of congenital adrenal hyperplasia and she proceeded to give us a tear jerking story and everything. And she actually had the hydrocortisone called Denver fire department and said that she couldn't give the kid the, the medicine because she was afraid to, and their medical director would not allow them to give it. And we're like, hold on, you had the medicine. You were taught how to give it. Why didn't you give it? Well, I was afraid I was going to hurt him. Yeah, but now you're trying to get everyone in the state of Texas to change practice because you're afraid of doing something that's going to save your kid. And, and we had a long discussion, including, so just curious, have you talked to the medical director for the ambulance service where you live? And she was like, no, I don't even know who it is. Where do you live? Fort Worth. Oh, well, John Griswold is at the table right here. You know, let us introduce you to him so that you can get this taken care of on a local basis. My whole point of that is that we really need to be proactive. We need to actually, if we have some of these people that, that have something like that, we need to say, okay, would you please be willing to call our administration and talk to our service director, possibly the medical director, and the reason that I say that, and I actually, this lady came back the next quarter wanting to address our group again, at which point I said, okay, have you talked to the medical director? Well, no, I got busy. Okay, have you called MedStar so that they can flag your address as somebody that has something? I didn't know that we could do that. Yes, we told you that the last time. So if you have a computerized dispatch, you have the ability to flag some of these sort of things so that you know that there's a special patient there. Um, and we also, as a medical director, I wanna know that these people are there so that we can talk with them ahead of time so that say on our, on our dispatch information, we can say, hey, you know, they have this certain med here, it is okay, I've already okayed you to give this or to do this or whatever it may be. Um, so an LVAD, you know, we definitely want to know if somebody has a left ventricular assist device. Those are very, very specialized things. We have some folks in our county that have congestive heart failure that have some infusion pumps of some very specialized medicines. We need to know about those things. So 
the other thing that I point out to people is if it's something that you haven't ever heard of before, there's some places that you can look these up. The one that actually during the meeting with this lady, I looked up on, on rarediseases.org and I, I looked at her and I said, okay, so ma'am, this particular condition there based on the population of my county, there should be 10 people with it. Can you tell me who they are? I'll go and find them. And she just kind of looked at me and I said, okay, you're telling me that you have a con your child has a condition. It's been diagnosed. You know what to do for it. They give you the medicine. You have the medicine. Why should we have to do that? So anyway, there, there are some things that, that we need to say, okay, people need to take some responsibility for themselves, but especially an orphan medication or, or a, a orphan condition that's about one in 1500 people that will have that. And so there are 6,800 rare diseases. So we cannot be expected to carry a treatment for every disease or condition, but we need to be proactive with these people and be able to say, okay, here's what we can try to help you with. And here's, and that really needs to be taken from you guys. You need to kick that up to administration. But I, if you're in my service, I want you to be the one to say, okay, I need you to call and write down the office phone number. And you need to ask for whether it's clinical coordinator or the service director and, and let us get that conversation started because we do want to provide for all of these people. We all do. Yeah, you know, I've said it before. Nobody goes into this business wanting to hurt anybody. We all want to help people. And in some of these cases where it's a rare condition, the best thing that we can do is actually to become aware of them so that we know that they're out there. And then that way we can try to say, okay, you're a one in, in 200,000 case. We want to help you. Help us to help you. Any other questions about that? So I see Christian there. <laughs> you know, once again, if you look at all of these things, treating their symptoms is really what all of these conditions that we talked about tonight comes down to. I don't think that we had anything in here that has a very specific treatment that you're not going to automatically want to consider other than perhaps steroids, but steroids all take time to work. So, you know, it's nice if we can get those on board, but for the most part, that's really not the mainstay. And yes, most of them have already been diagnosed beforehand, but, you know, and I would say that if I, if I were the one writing national registry, I'm going to want you to know thyroid storm and sickle cell. Those are really, in my opinion, and obviously I'm not the one that writes their exam, but those are really the big high value targets, in my opinion. Yeah, Graves, Addison's. And honestly, you know, if you think about it, steroids, steroids, steroids. So um, the last time that I did a oral recertification in our board up until the year after I did my research, we had to do an oral board every time. And they made special cases for us that were board examiners. And I actually ended up with one that was a uh, uh, thyrotox or a Addison's. So, you know, yeah, I, I actually kind of floundered on it a little bit, but I finally got around to the, to the right thing. So, Anyway, any other questions? Y'all all typed your questions. I'm used to, you know, the more verbal interactive. But Jane, I would say that they definitely were very interactive tonight. Yes, more they so were. than any, any other night that I've been on. Yes, they so were. I you guys asked a lot of great questions. Um, Really appreciate it. And Dr. Phillips, we wish you a very, very Merry Christmas and holiday season. Oh. Uh, yes, and for those of you out there 